The history of America is ultimately one defined by its people. As author and playwright Lillian Hellman once stated, history is made by the masses of people. One man or ten men don't start the earthquakes and don't stop them either. This principle, that the people dictate history, has been enshrined in American governmental tradition. The founding fathers of this country spoke highly of inalienable rights to all men, such as the right to free speech and organization. However, one only has to take a look at history to understand that these principles, which have been held in so high regard, have been frequently and carelessly abandoned. Oppression of free speech and the right to organize, by the state and private industry alike, has defined the history of labor organization. This could not be more true in the example of the Ludlow Massacre, one of the most deadly attacks on workers' rights in all of American history. To understand the importance of this event, we must contextualize the material conditions in which it occurred. As the United States expanded to the Pacific Coast as part of the Manifest Destiny Doctrine, industry was incentivized to grow in the West. Arguably, the most important industry in the Rocky Mountain region was mining. Rich deposits of coal, iron, and other materials were readily available to whichever companies were willing to establish themselves. One major company at the time was Colorado Fuel and Iron, often called CFNI. Created in 1892 and later controlled by John D. Rockefeller in 1903, it would become a critical part of Rockefeller's effort to monopolize fuel production. Since early in the existence of Rockefeller CFNI, relations between the company and its workers have been poor. Long working hours, poor conditions, and occasionally injury and death were commonplace. This would lead workers' unions, such as the Western Federation of Miners, abbreviated as the WFM, and the United Mine Workers of America, the UMWA, to gain support from these disgruntled workers. The animosity between the workers and capitalists would come to a head a variety of times. Before the massacre at Ludlow, the Colorado Labor Wars of 1903 and 04 would be the most violent escalation of a labor dispute in the region. The aforementioned Western Federation of Miners would lead gold and silver miners to go on strike in seven major cities to gain an eight-hour workday and end child labor. In response to this strike, private militias and the National Guard were called to stop the strikers. Martial law was declared by the National Guard, and at least 19 workers would be killed. This bloody event would set the standard of violence for strikes in the region, especially by company-funded mercenaries and the National Guard. Despite the violence taken against them, the workers would not be deterred. In fact, they would stand stronger in their stance, adopting socialist ideals such as class struggle. Socialist leader of the WFM union, Big Bill Haywood, would state that the capitalists of the mining industry, quote, did not find the gold, they did not mine the gold, they did not mill the gold, but by some weird alchemy, all the gold belonged to them, end quote. The fighting spirit of these miners would come to another climax in 1913. Labor tensions arose yet again over the enforcement of workplace regulation laws, and the United Mine Workers of America organized a strike that began on September 23, 1913. This strike would begin the Colorado Coalfield Wars, not to be confused with the previous labor wars. Workers all across the state left their company-owned houses, setting up encampments outside of the coal fields. I stand outside the location of the encampment of Ludlow right now. 1,200 of the 20,000 striking miners and their families would camp outside for the duration of the strike. While minor agitation by private guards would occur in September of 1913, the conflict Ludlow is known for would only begin in October. Mercenaries and guards, hired by Colorado Fuel and Iron, uh, fired machine guns at the striking workers. In response, the workers would arm themselves and harass the strike breakers. While this initial incident would result in no casualties, it would only be the first of what was to soon come. On November 1st, General John Chase of the National Guard would intervene to disarm both sides. However, the National Guard would eventually focus their efforts against the workers. On the morning of April 20th, 1914, National Guardsmen would fire directly at these striking workers and their families. For a period of 10 days, all-out war occurred in Ludlow. National Guardsmen utilized machine guns mounted on armored cars to suppress the striking workers. 
many private companies of the region, not just CFNI, would increase their material support for the National Guard by hiring more mercenaries. The encampments of the workers' families would be burned, which would cause the majority of deaths in this massacre. While many of the casualties were the workers themselves, a wide variety of the victims were their workers' families. Twelve of the twenty lives known to be lost were under the age of twelve. Following the massacre at Ludlow and harsh anti-union suppression across the state, the strike would be forcefully stopped. Due to the intensity of the fighting and the valiant efforts by the striking workers, CFNI would not leave unscathed. Six company towns, including Ludlow, would be permanently shut down. What was once a what was once a quickly growing settlement is now a ghost town. But don't let modern Ludlow's landscape dismay you. For a short period, brave men, women, and children fought against insurmountable odds for their rights. Facing harsh repression from the state and the capitalists, mm. these, worker these workers stood in solidarity to demand what was rightfully theirs. Regardless of the outcome of this event, or any related event, take this as a testament to the power of the working people in a union. And most importantly, do not let the sacrifices of the workers and their families go in vain or be forgotten. As a result of the Coalfield Wars and Ludlow Massacre, no labor dispute in Colorado would reach the amount of violence previously seen. This would begin the foundation of modern unions. The UMWA is still active and organizes its mine workers across the country. It was largely responsible for promoting the construction of the Ludlow Memorial. While the monument may be a physical representation of the legacy of the massacre, its most prominent effect is showing the need for labor organization. Without the efforts of union men and women, the relentless exploitation by mine owners would never have been curbed. Today, we have seen the results of lack of union organization. As the rich get richer, the working people still suffer. But Ludlow reminds us that the united power of working people can pose a threat to anyone who stands in our way. And as unionization numbers increase, and workers at places such as Amazon continue to stand for their rights, it is proven that hope for a better future is far from lost. Just as an old union saying goes, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever.